see me? <laughs> That's the hard question. I once went to speak in a shul where they had me stand up on a little step ladder that the bar mitzvah boys who are too short have to stand up on. So I'm glad that you can hear me and I'm glad that you can see me. So first I will start off with my drink of water. And, and if I had to, you know, encapsulate my story in, in one sentence, it's that the essence of that very bracha, that if God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. My story is a story of naysayers every step of the way. Everyone said, well, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Now I know that I have 45 minutes, and I'm going to try to share with you more than 30 years of my journey in these 45 minutes. And somebody please keep track of the time, because when I speak, I, I tend to never go in order, and I never may always lose track of the time. So it's an honor for me to be here. It's an honor and it's a privilege for me to be here. When I was invited before the pandemic about four years ago, I didn't think it was going to happen. I said, wow, they invited me to Berlin University. I couldn't believe it. And now I see it is true. And I see a wonderful audience. I got to meet some lovely women this morning. And I'm just blown away by your hospitality and by your sense of spirit and your community. I'm I'm almost humbled, like the name of Humboldt, you know, just like it's, it's a nice play on words. It's a perfect place for me to sit and think back to myself, like, wow, how did I get here? Now, I have a, a special assignment that I was supposed to pick a topic that, I was gonna, that was going to be appropriate for this prestigious audience. And when Sarah called me, she said, pick a topic and then bring it in and compare the Jewish law and the secular law. And I said, I've never really done that before. I usually just share my story. And what topic am I going to pick that's going to really be relevant? I don't want to get, as a sitting judge in New York, I don't know about the laws here, but as a sitting judge in New York, I cannot discuss politics, not in any country, and I can't discuss any court cases, or any court cases that are pending, which means it could be appealed. So I'm very limited. And I actually called up the rabbi, and I'm very close with the Barbach, and I said, give me a suggestion of what you think I should discuss. And I asked my, one of my son-in-laws, who was a big town with Chafam, I said, what topic do you think I should discuss? And they both said, Kibadava Aim, the laws of honoring your parents. And I said, okay, something I should do myself anyhow. So let me go and take this and just bite right into it. And I was kind of blown away by the comparison you know, the, the, what we could compare and what you could contrast. And, and I was reading a lot and reading, and I was reading different essays. And so first I need to explain to you that I'm not a speaker. I'm not a professor, I'm not a speaker, I'm not a lecturer. I'm Jules Rogi, and I like to share my story. And I get invited to different venues, and I share my story. But this is a challenging one because I'm given an assignment. So what I really like to do is share my background with you whatever wasn't covered in the introduction. Then I will talk about Kibbut al Ba'im, and then we'll go back to my story. And then if we have time within this tight schedule, I'd love to hear some questions from the audience because I feel that when I hear your questions, I could relate to you so much more. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Sarah, for all the work that you've done. And thank you, the professors and the rabbis and all of you who put this whole program together. When I go around speaking, what I've learned is that we all come from different backgrounds. And by the time I finish speaking, I realize there's so much that we have in common, so much more that we share as human beings and our values than it actually separates us. My background is I come from the Hasidic community. I grew up in Borough Park, and I'm very proud to be the mother of six children and now grandchildren, and we don't count grandchildren. And for me, what was always interesting is how I was able to go on my journey and, and not give up. And how that I was able to do that is what I'm going to share with you. But in a nutshell, I graduated high school when I was 17 years old. And back in those days, there were no college opportunities for the Hasidic community. And if you figure out how old I am by the time I'm finished, it's, it's OK. And um, I got a job as a legal secretary because my high school gave a course called legal stenography, which prepared us how to be legal secretaries. 
And I took that course, it was a very complicated course. I think in the beginning of the semester, there were like 40 girls who signed up. By the time it was over, only half were left in the class. So I was working in large firms and small firms, and I was rising up the ladder. And then when I turned 30, I started to work for lawyers that were younger than me. And that just didn't sit right with me. And I said, if I was given the opportunity, I would probably do the same thing that these lawyers are doing. But why, why can't I do it? Now, I was raised that if you were going to be a good Hasidic girl and raise a nice Jewish family, you really couldn't have a career. It was either one or the other. And I thought to myself, why is that? Why are they mutually exclusive? Why can't I have both? But that was my own very personal dream, my, my personal journey. I really didn't want to share it with anybody. I never thought that it would be a reason to, to get invited internationally, but that was my personal journey. <coughs> so let, let me talk to you about my background. I grew up and I have an amazing set of parents. My mother is my best friend. And my parents were always humble, simple people, smart people, but they weren't part of any Hasidic or biblical dynasty. They weren't connected politically. They weren't wealthy, just hardworking parents. And my mother, she's still my best friend. She taught us girls, because I, when I was born, I was the oldest, and then I had my three sisters. And then my baby brother was born after I was married. In fact, my mother and I were expecting the same time. My brother is six weeks older than my son. So my mother said to us, girls, you can do anything you want to do in life, so long as it isn't illegal, immoral, or against the Torah. So even though I grew up in an ultra-Orthodox city home, I never felt confined or restricted. I knew there were rules, but I never felt like I was being squished or couldn't do something that I really wanted to do. And my father, he was very tough on good manners. He didn't really care what my grades were in school. In fact, when he would come to PTA, the first question he would ask the teacher is, how does my daughter behave? That's what was most important to him. And I wasn't the smartest girl in the class either. In fact, a couple of years ago, when my youngest, so I have three boys and three girls in that order. Anybody here remember the Brady Bunch? That was a show on American TV. Well, I had like the Brady Bunch in that order, but one husband. So when my youngest, my youngest are twin girls. When they were in their 12th grade in high school, I went to the PTA. And the teacher looks at me, she says, hey, Ruchi, I remember you. I was in your sister Simi's class. And I look at her and say, oh, yeah, you look familiar. And she says to me, did you become a lawyer? And I say, yes, I did. She says, you know, come to think of it, you weren't one of the smart girls. <laughs> and she was, she was right. I was just a very average girl, a very average student. But my parents believed in us. I remember my father calling me up once. He says, Ruchi, I'm in Manhattan, and I'm by the newsstand. And there's a magazine here, and the front cover says, the top 50 lawyers in America. But Ruchi, I don't see your picture in here. I said, well, Tati, I said, it will be a while. I don't know if my picture will ever get in here. So now that I told you about my parents, let's move to the topic of Kibbut of Ba'in, honoring your mother and your father. Talk about the Jewish laws about this, about this commandment, and then talk about the secular law. So, you know what's interesting? The other night, now my father, he should have her four shalema, is not very well, and we take care of him. And the other, and between my siblings and I, we rotate, and it was just the other night, I'm confused where really, one was last night because I lost a night in my traveling. But I wanted to go to my office to prepare for the lecture. And my father needed to have a treatment, a nebulized treatment. So I called up my brother and I said, Michelle, I got to run. I have to do something. So when you come home, you do the, the, you give Tati the medication. And I said, what did I just say? So Ruchi, you have to practice what you preach. Stop what you're doing right now. You take care of Tati. And then you go and prepare your speech. Because I realized I can't just talk about keep it up, aim. I have to really be proficient at this. Okay, so let's talk about the law first. Now, I didn't, I'm not here as a law professor. 
I did preliminary research. I did enough to get an understanding of it. And just to give you a brief overview of the law and their obligations between parents and children and children and parents. So let's talk about the obligations that parents have to children. Give them food, shelter, and clothing. Make sure they get an education, but the state will most likely pay for the education. They have to have good health and, and medication, but the state will cover the cost of that as well. And what's the duration of this parental responsibility? Until the child reaches their majority. In most states, it's 18 years old. Now, there are obligations that children have towards parents. And what are those obligations under the law? Well, as long as the parents are responsible for their children, the children have to be obedient. Until they reach their majority, they have to be obedient and follow the wishes of the parents, unless they are emancipated. <laughs> Sounds like a professor? Now, emancipation in American law are certain exceptions where children under the age of 18 don't have to be under their parents' jurisdiction anymore. They join the military, they have a baby, they move out of the house and support themselves, then they don't have to listen to the parents. And what is the reward that the law gives if you listen to your parents? Nothing. The law doesn't promise you anything. You just do it because you have to. And then there are cases where the parental responsibility will go farther even after the parent dies, the children can sue the estate of the parents for the support that the child needs. That's basically, in a nutshell, what I saw as obligations between parents and children and children and parents. Now let's step over into the halacha. I'm not a rabbi. <laughs> That's my big disclaimer here. But under the halacha, a parent has obligations for their children. If it's a baby boy, they have to give him a smila, and if they don't have benefits applicable, they have to give their child a chinuch, an education. They have to teach the child a trade, a livelihood. And if not, it's almost considered as if teaching the child how to steal. The Gemara also says they have to teach the child how to swim, but that really means how to survive. Because back in those times, you didn't know how to swim. Congress was through shipping. You could die. So what's that? And then to make a bar mitzvah and a bar mitzvah, and to marry off the child. Now, I always wondered, how come in my community, parents are so involved in marrying off their children? Because it's a responsibility. We're not just being nice. We have to marry off our children. So that's what parents have to do for children. Now. What are the child's responsibility towards the parents? And that is so big that I'm going to really try my best just to give you the basic nuts and bolts about this commandment. So where does it come from? Where's the first time that we hear that children have to respect their parents? You all know it's the Ten Commandments, right? It's the Aseris Adibros. Now, what's interesting about the Aseris Adibros, aside from the fact that it was given in such a profound way, which makes those Ten Commandments so important, they're divided. You all have seen the picture of Moses holding the two tablets. I think the original was really square, not round, but for some reason, history makes them round. So there's two sides, and the first five are commandments that relate between man and God, and the second, the second five are the commandments that relate between man and his fellow men. But what's interesting is that the commandment to honor your parents is on the side of the relationship between man and God. Why? Why does God place such importance on honoring your parents that he places it on the same section where he talks about how you have to honor God? Because when you honor your parents, you're honoring God. There's three partners to, to a human being when they're created, their parents and God. And when you learn to honor your parents, you learn to honor God. When you learn to honor your parents, you learn to appreciate and not take things for granted. And ultimately, our greatest appreciation always has to go to God. But God doesn't say you have to love your parents. You have to honor them. And how? So, 
the, the, there's verses that say that you have to honor your mother and father, and you have to fear your mother and your father. So you have to honor and fear. What does that mean? Honor are the positive commandments, and fear of negative commandments. So how do you honor your parents? Very basic. It's the reverse now. It's the food, the clothing, and shelter. Make sure your parent has what to eat. Make sure your parent has satisfactory living conditions. Escort your parents if they have to be escorted. And keep them clean, wash them. How do you fear your parents? You don't sit in your parents' place. I never knew why we were always raised, you don't sit in Tati's chair, you don't sit in Mommy's chair. We always saw it, but never really understood why. You don't contradict your parents. You don't argue with them. You don't call them by their first name. You don't disparage them. But you don't have to continue a vendetta that they have. So there are some exceptions of what you have to do, what you don't have to do. But what's the duration of this command? Right? Remember we said that by law, the duration of the obligation is once you reach your majority. That the duration is forever in perpetuity. Even after your parent is no longer in this world, you still have to honor and respect your parent's memory. And what's the reward? That's a big one. Arichas Yomim, long life. And we learned that long life means also in the afterlife. So the difference is so stark in terms of what the reward is in law and what the reward is in halacha and what you have to do and how much more the children are obligated to their parents than the reverse. I couldn't have been what I am today had not been for my parents. My parents are just the most amazing parents. They made us feel that we can do anything. Truthfully, I was really very lucky. I was raised and brought up in the 1970s and 1980s, where kids were valued because we were there. I am the oldest child of Holocaust, I'm sorry, of the oldest grandchild of Holocaust survivors, and my father also was a Holocaust survivor. So my generation proved that the Jewish nation is eternal. No one can destroy the Jewish nation. Am Yisrael chay v'chayel. So when I went to school, when my generation went to school, all we had to do was breathe. You inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, and the teachers would call us tired kid. Now when I speak Yiddish to this audience, I assume that most of you will understand my Yiddish. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Most of the time when I go around speaking, I have to translate every word, which I will do now as well. But a lot of the German words I understand because it's so similar to the Yiddish. But the main theme that I really want to share with everybody, and why I actually go around speaking, is the message that I have learned from my story, is that you don't have to compromise your values to succeed in the outside world. Whatever, whatever connection everyone, and we all have a connection to God. We all have our own unique spiritual connection with God. And whatever connects you to God, hang on to it with all your strength and courage. And don't ever think that you have to let go to succeed, whether it's the corporate world, the academic world, the medical world, wherever you go, you don't have to. And in fact, when I go around speaking to young schools, schools and I speak to young students who are graduating, I tell them, you're going to graduate school and you're going to go out and you're going to learn a lot. You'll be exposed to many different forces out here. But don't think for a second that you're going to get a better job if you compromise your values. In fact, it's just the opposite. Because when you stick to your values, whether you're going to a corporate meeting and you're eating your kosher food, or you're going home early because Shabbos is coming, the message that you're giving to your coworkers and your colleagues is that you're a person of loyalty, honesty, integrity, and respect. And when there's a corporate secret that they have, who do you think they would trust if not the person who doesn't compromise their values? I have a couple of stories that I want to share with you. I don't know how much time we have, so I'll maybe just share one or two, and then if we have time later, we'll open the floor for questions and see if I can share more stories. But I have learned from my experience 
that when you show people that you have standards, they will not let you let go. Because people want to have people that they can look up to. So I'll give you a couple of short little stories. And I, I'll change the names of the people in the story, but the stories are true. So when I was a legal secretary, I got a job in Manhattan. I reached a point, at one point, I said, I outgrew small offices, I'm going to Manhattan. I got a job in a large law firm, and I learned about Dress Down Friday. Anybody here know what Dress Down Friday is? Nobody? Nobody. I see some hands in the back over there. Okay, good. So for all those of you who don't know, Dress Down Friday, at least in New York, is in these corporate offices, they don't want you to feel that you're working so hard in the summer on Friday. So on Friday, in July and August, you don't have to come dressed formally. You can dress down. You can't wear shorts. There are some rules, but no tie, no suit, just a completely informal day. And I found that about Dress Down Friday. And I come from Bar Park. In Bar Park, we like to dress up, not down. So every Friday, I opened up my closet, what should I wear today? I didn't know what to wear. And I, back then, I had this denim dress. And I knew that from my standards, now by the way, when I share my stories, don't expect, I don't expect anyone to take upon themselves my Hasidic standards. But I'm just going to share them with you so you can take everything I'm saying into context. So I had a denim dress that I wore, and I knew that my sleeves on that dress were borderline sleeves. So I have to wear sleeves that cover my elbows. Now, about 20 years ago, there was a revolution in how women dress. They came out with something called a shell. And I'm wearing one today. In fact, I wear one almost every day, like most of us do. They come in high cut, in cotton, short sleeve, long sleeve, every color you can imagine. And right now, whenever I go shopping, you just buy a shell and you have no problem. But years ago, when you bought a dress, if the sleeves were too short, you went to the tailor. If the neckline was too big, you went to the tailor. If it was too short, you went to the tailor. It was very, very different back then. So I had that dress. And why was it borderline? Because if I picked up my arms, like my jacket now, it went up. But hey, I'm working in Manhattan on Lexington Avenue. Who cares about working for your sleeves? Or so I thought. So I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm typing. And one of the attorneys that I was assigned to work for, who was Jewish but not religious, comes over to me. And he says, Rachel, I see your forearms. And he's probably his eyes. I want to tell you something. That when I went to school, we used to have these modesty teachers who would check and make sure they were all dressed appropriately. None of them ever impacted me like that young attorney. It was like he punched me in my gut. Because his message to me was, I know you're religious, and I know you dress modestly, and I'm sure you don't know that your sleeves are too short. I went home that day and I threw out that dress. Let me share with you a story about handshaking. Okay? Now, handshaking is one of these rules that have many, many different interpretations in how that rule is carried out. And they're all acceptable depending on where you come from. So I was at the point when I was opening up my law practice. And I wanted to know from the rabbis, how does the handshake rule apply to me? So I pulled up the rabbi and I said, I have six children, I'm married, I'm opening up my law practice. What's the rule with shaking hands? Oh, Mrs. Friary says to me, it's preferred you don't shake hands with men. But if the man is going to be insulted, then by all means shake his hand. So I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do? I'll be going to a meeting, going to a closing, and say, oh, he's embarrassed. Oh, he's not. He is. Maybe I'm going to start cross-examining people. This is not going to work for me. My name is Rufa Fryer. My husband is Hassan. I don't shake hands with men. And if you don't want me to be your lawyer, there's the door. God help me. My first clients were sat in the seat. If they looked me in the eye, that was forward. <laughs> Anyhow. I had a closing, and my clients were chassidim, and were sitting in the, in the conference room, and the bank attorney knew my husband. Everybody was chassidic in that room. And he comes in, and he starts shaking everyone's head. He comes to me, and I said to him, John, you know I can't do that. And he gives me this big hug, and he says, oh, Rachel, I'm so sorry I forgot. Had there been a hole under the table, I would have gone straight 
straight onto the, onto the table. <laughs> so people often ask me if I have a role model. Is it Golden in the Year? Is it Ruth Bader Ginsburg? And I say no. It's this quiet woman from <coughs> Poland who lived in Krakow between the two world wars, and her name was Sarah Shanira. And Sarah Shanira was the founder of the Bisakwa movement. She was the one who really changed Jewish history because at that time when she lived in Poland, what we learned about in history, we called it the advent of the isms. Communism, socialism, Marxism, all the isms were coming up. And the boys at that time in the shtetls were learning and they were going to, to secular school because the rule was everybody went to public school, then after school, the boys learned with the rebbies, and the girls would learn at home whatever they had to know. But when these, when these winds were sweeping through Europe, the girls were getting lost. They weren't retaining their Jewish identity. They didn't know enough to fight all the, all the influences that were in them. So Sarah Shneer said, we have to make schools for girls. Now, when I went to school, my teachers were the students of Sarah Shneer. And they told us all about her. We sang songs about her. But they never told us that she had opposition. I didn't know about it until I read a book about her life that was written quite recently. It's called Carry Me in Your Heart. And when I read the part that she had opposition, I said, now I have my role model. Now I know that it's okay for me to do what I'm doing because people often ask me, Ruchi, how could you consider yourself Hasidic when you have such a public personality and you're, you're on TV and, you're, and you have a profession? How, how do you call yourself Hasidic? And I knew that I'm doing nothing wrong, but I didn't really know how to articulate it until I read the book. And Sarah Shneewa taught her students a very important lesson. A Jewish daughter has to always wear a dress with two pockets. In one pocket, you carry the verse from Psalms from Tehillim, called Kuda Basmela Pnima. King David writes that the beauty and the honor of a Jewish woman is what's internal. And whatever modesty leads to you, carry it like a badge of pride, because that's what identifies you as a Jewish daughter. But, Sarah Shneewa told her students, on the other pocket, you carry another verse from Psalms, Isla so Hashem, Hashem, Torah Sacha. There comes a time to act. And ace last so girls, when you see people are trampling Torah values, you stand up, you be leaders, and people will follow you. And I said, okay, it's okay to be religious and a woman and to have a position of leadership. It's okay. But what, what was interesting is that of all the people who predicted that if I go on higher education, I'll stray from the path. I won't be as religious. My experience was just the opposite. The farther and farther I got in my profession, I like to say profession, not career, because career has this connotation that your family's on the back burner. My family's always on the front burner. What I learned is more and more, I was inspiring to law students to become religious. I was doing holiday events in Brooklyn Law School. I learned that the, that the more I was going outside, the more I value what I had inside. So I'm going to share with you what I did in law school. Now, all the predictions, all the naysayers, when I, when I started college, it was really an extension of, of high school. Toro College, it's a Jewish college, and there were separate classes for men and women, and the teachers were mostly Jewish, so it really wasn't so much of, of a challenge. But when I started law school, I said, now I'm all over the world. How will I withstand all the influences of a very liberal academic environment? I'll be in a classroom that's mixed with Jews and non-Jews and men and women, and I've never had this before. How am I going to withstand this? And I was going to go part-time, which is four years. So I remember coming into the building and thinking to myself, God, I'm going to make a deal with you. Help me get through law school without compromising my values. And when your children come to me for help, I will help them. So what I did was, I also made sure that while I was in law school, I was going to do outreach, and I made holiday events, and I was going to make sure that I was going to continue praying three times a day. I pray three times a day. While women don't have that obligation, and men do, and men have to do it in a minion with nine other men to stay focused, but women can pray alone, and our prayers alone 
went straight to heaven. So I prayed in law school, and I also did my outreach events. And when I was home, when I got to law school, I was looking for a place to pray. Now, I'm not embarrassed to pray. I have my sitter with me, and I can pray on the plane coming here. I can pray on the train. But I'm going to be in law school. Where am I going to dive in? Where am I going to pray? You know, if I'm going to go in the law school library and I'm standing, throwing an ashtray and my lips are moving, I'm not embarrassed. People will be looking at me, and maybe I'll be self-conscious. So I asked one of the law students there, I said to her, can you recommend a place for me to dive in? She says, Ruchi, the staircase behind the cafeteria has a staircase behind the staircase. And if you dive in there, nobody will see you. So for four years, I dive in there. For four years, I did my outreach. And then came graduation. So I went, to the, I went to the security guards over there. I wanted to thank them. There were two African-American men. And whenever I did my holiday events, they would help me with all my props. My kids would come and play the keyboard and play holiday songs. And I would make a poem party or a face up there. So I said to them, I want to thank you guys because you were so helpful. And I'm going to miss you. I can't believe four years of law school are over. And they said, yeah, Rachel, we're going to miss you too with your little book. My little book. I said, my law school books weigh more than me. What are you talking about, Clyde? Oh, we used to watch you on the security camera every day. <laughs> I didn't realize that the staircase behind the staircase was a fire exit. And here I was with my little book, Dominic Mencha, every day. And the, the, the lesson that I learned is when you stick to your values, you have no idea who you can inspire, and how you can sanctify God's name, how you can make a Kiddush Hashem just by sticking to your values. When I graduated law school, God wasted no time in testing me. My first, my first project was working with youth at risk. It just came out of nowhere. I was on my annual trip to Israel for Lot Omer, like I'm going next this, this week. Um, I was, and I met a woman there who told me she's coming to Miron to Daven for her son because he's been expelled from yeshiva after yeshiva and now he's on the street and she's coming to Miron to Daven for him. And I said to her, Chani, we're going to come back to America and I'm going to help your son. I'm a lawyer, I have connections, I'll get him back into yeshiva. I was very naive. We came back to Barapak and I called her and I said, Honey, I want to meet your son. Let's get, let's get our act together. Ruchi, before we get started, I want you to call my friend Shane because her son, Sruli, and my son, they're out in the street together. And before I knew it, I was talking to so many women whose kids were suffering the same thing. And I interviewed these kids and I realized they're not bad boys. They're making bad choices because they've been through trauma. And I advocated for them and I started a program for them. And then by the time some other people in the community came and took over on Yeshiva, I helped the Yeshiva open up in Williamsburg, I was able to take a step back. And then came the story of Ezra's Nashim. Random phone call one night, hierarchy, we're a group of EMTs, we're meeting tonight, do you want to join us? So can you help us? You really have to see the documentary film because that was a story, it was like a 10 year journey. A 10 year journey of advocating, going to medical training myself, I became an EMT, then a paramedic. But the people who opposed me then still oppose me today. And now that I'm running to be elected as state Supreme Court, I have the same opposition. But we know that when you're doing something good, you have to expect opposition. People ask you, okay, what keeps you going? How do you continue going on? So the, the rabbi in Bar I'm very close with always tells me, Mrs. Raya, I want to give you chizuk. I want to give you some, I want to encourage you and strengthen you to continue going on. That when God blessed Avram Avinu, God blessed Abraham and said, those that bless you, I will bless, and those that curse you, I will curse. Is that the best God could do? It's God after all. Couldn't God say, Abraham, everyone will bless you? But no. And you're, you're in the public eye, you're going to have opposition. And you have to expect it, and you have to own it. Now there's an expression in Yiddish, and I'll translate it. Let's see if you can understand my Yiddish. Go get it? When you do a mitzvah for somebody else, you're going to find out one day that you actually helped yourself. So people ask me, how did you become a judge? How did it happen? So my uncle, 
Allah Hashem, a blessed memory, his name was Dovi Schmidt. When he married my mother's sister, I was a little girl. And I watched Dovi go become a lawyer, and then become a clerk for a judge, and then become a judge. He was my mentor. And I always said to him, Dovi, I want to be a judge like you one day. And one day I got a phone call from him, Ruchi, I'm retiring this year. If you still want to be a judge, you're going to have to run from my original seat. I said, run? A campaign? An election? Oh no, my poor husband. He puts up with so much, I can't imagine doing that. But this is what my uncle said had to be done. So it was around so this time. And I had to see, because no matter how confident we are as women, no matter how capable we are, we need the support of the men in our lives. So I had to break this news to my husband and my children. And I was like this, and I'm coming into the circle with a plate, of a tray of chicken soup. And he must stand and I say, so, my uncle Dovi called me up, and he said he's retiring, and that I should run for a seat to become a judge. Silence. <laughs> my husband picks up his head and says, do you want to be a judge? We'll get good health insurance coverage. <laughs> I think you will. Well, let me tell you, if you think that I ran, you're making a big mistake. It's the Fryer family that ran. We turned Barapak on its head. My kids made up jingles in Yiddish. They took my palm. My son said, Mommy, I'm going to take your palm pause and translate it into Yiddish. And we're going to put it in all the shuls in Barapak. Bob, Satma, Pop, Bell, Vision, and Skolia, You get the truth? And Mommy, we're going to put it where the men read in the bathrooms. And then you should have seen my kids with the long black coats and the long face and the black hats standing on the street corners. Vote for Freya! This is my mama! <laughs> Your mother, like, who is she? But we made history. And I, by the way, my opponents put up an Orthodox man to run against me. And because the Jewish vote was now split, a non-religious Jewish woman also put her hat in the race, and it was a three-way race, a very, very tight race, and I got 40%. So Baruch Hashem, I was able to succeed. And if God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. But let me tell you, I found out that even though I ran for civil court, I found out two weeks before my term started, my first assignment was criminal court. Criminal court, I told them, you're making a mistake. I'm, I'm Hasidic, I don't even watch movies. What do I know about crime? I know nothing about crime. <laughs> don't worry, Judge Bible, you're gonna go to judge school. Well, judge school was three days. <laughs> so there I am, the first week, I'm sitting on the bench doing arraignments, and the defendants are coming out in the jumpsuits, like from the, from the cells, in handcuffs. And I'm on the bench, I'm saying, Hashem, what do I know? How am I gonna make decisions gonna affect the lives of these kids? I have to make rulings. They would give me the rap sheet. Rap sheets like all the crimes. Some kids had loose leaves of rap sheets. And you have to move quickly because there's a whole line of defendants. And if you take too much time, they would have to stay longer. And I have to quickly go through everything and make a decision. When I looked at these boys, I looked them in the eye. You know what I saw? I saw the same pain in the eyes of these kids that I saw in the eyes of the kids that I counseled in my Badera program for boys. There was no difference. It made no difference where these kids came from. They had been through trauma and it's the same pain. And you know what I did? I spoke to these young defendants from the inner city of New York and I said to them, you gotta believe in yourself. The same things that I spoke to these kids at risk from Laura Park, all the total values that I had that I would say to these kids, I would share them from the bench. And I had grown men cry in my court and they would say, Your Honor, no one ever spoke to us like that before. But then the prosecutor would say, But Your Honor, what about the victim? What about her injuries? Your Honor, we have photographs of those injuries. I'm sure you don't want to see it. And I would say, Wait a second, I'm a paramedic. I want to see those photographs, counselor. <laughs> Hand it up to me right now. So there you see, I thought I was doing the Badera program to help the kids, and I did SOS Nashim to help the women, but the first two years that I was on the bench in criminal court, that was the best experience I had to be able to do those arraignments. 
but the real best experience of being the judge is being the mother. I was looking at Raymond at once, and both lawyers were arguing, and one tells the other, stop interrupting me. She can't hear us both at the same time. Counselors, I raised six kids. I can hear you both at the same time. <laughs> In any case, I like to end off my, my lectures, or my, my speeches, or my talks with a little Hasidic story. And this is the story of Rabbi Elimelech of Lugens. Right? Know the story, anybody? Elimelech of Lugens was one of the first, first Hasidic rabbis. And he is on his, I'm sorry, I got mixed up. Abzisha of Anipol, go back a little bit further. Abzisha was one of the first, first Hasidic rabbis. And he's on his deathbed. And Abzisha is crying. And the Hasidim around his bedside asked Abzisha, why is the Rebbe crying? You're such a holy man. You're going to go straight to Gan Eden. And he said, I'm not crying because up in heaven they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Moshe Rabbeinu? Why weren't you like Moses? And I'm not crying because they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like King David of Hamelach? I'm crying because they're going to ask me, Zisha, why weren't you like Zisha could have been? Do we know what our potential is? Do we know the power of the Selenelokim that we have in us? We are all created in the image of God, the Selenelokim. Do we know what we can accomplish? What I have learned is that for everything that I ever wanted to do, I had a few people who told me it was never going to happen. Never going to happen. And I always say, if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. You have to believe that you are all have that connection with God. You have to keep that connection strong. Never stop praying, and just believe that if God wants something to happen, it's going to happen. And you, you remember the story in Egypt, in Mitzrayim, when the, the, the ruler Paro made this command that all the baby boys had to be thrown into the Nile River. And the mother of Moses doesn't know what to do. She puts them into a wicker basket in the Nile River. And who comes out to swim? No one but the daughter of Paro. She sees the basket. And she hears a baby crying, but the basket was way beyond her reach. And what does the what does the Torah teach us? That she stretched out her hand to try to reach it, and God did the rest. He made her hand long enough to reach the baby. And of course the rest is history. But all we have to do is lift our hand and try, and you will be successful. And do whatever you can to be Makadashim Shemaya. By being proud of who you are and your values, you will sanctify God's name. And remember about honoring your parents because that is another way that you honor God and you sanctify God by honoring your parents. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if I went beyond the